Donald Trump's indictment has drawn many reactions, and some of them in politics fall along some familiar lines. We've discussed that tonight. It's also striking to see these reports that many who know Trump personally or worked for him are quietly cheering. A reminder how Trump is more opposed and, by their own words, hated by many of his closest associates far more than other people in politics or business and other hard-charging fields. It's a dynamic we have actually witnessed from the witnesses, the former colleagues, the employees, the insiders that we've heard from right here on The Beat. Indeed, across the Trump era, I will tell you, one of Donald Trump's most articulate and poignant critics was a writer who initially helped channel Trump's voice or even made it sound better than its reality. I'm talking about the New York Times veteran who co-wrote The Art of the Deal, Tony Schwartz, who became a public critic and long said it would be the fear of real criminal accountability that would move Trump more than anything else. He's worried he's about to get criminally indicted and that he could end up in prison. That notion that he's a con man, uh, believe me, that's deep inside what he knows himself to be. He's, he's deeply fear-driven. That's really at the heart of it. Anger, rage is the only emotion available to Donald Trump. He doesn't traffic in other emotions. There's an awful lot of uh, behaviors and choices and actions that he's taken that are potentially criminal. The DA now agrees, as does a grand jury. The fear has become reality with the criminal indictment, and Tony Schwartz is exactly who we want to hear from on this special newsworthy historic night. He's a friend of the beat. He's the co-author of Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal. Longtime Beat viewers will remember him. People joining on a big news night like this will be introduced. Welcome back, Tony. Thanks for having me. Did you think this day would ever come for this man? Karma's a bitch. Um, I did in I did always believe that the likelihood was that you can't run forever. You can run, but you cannot hide. And there would be at some point it would catch up with him. Did I believe he'd be indicted? I, I, I don't know that I thought a lot about that, but I did know that I, we were talking about a career criminal. We were talking about a career felon and that, you know, in my estimation, he committed scores of crimes over the last 50 years. And, uh, you know, a cat has nine lives, but doesn't have 900 lives. Hmm. You spent this time with him in those early days. You shadowed him. Then you worked with him on what was, in a sense, a collaboration, a role that many people would find hard to imagine him doing. How did that man that you spent time with, how does he process something like this right now? Well, at the risk of repeating myself since you played an old clip... Well, you know what Lecrae says. Well, I no, I don't know what Lecrae says. He says... The reason why I sound the same is the truth don't change. The truth don't change, all right, and he's all rage all the time. Right. So I think what's happening right now is that he moves between rage and literally uh, a blend of delusion and dissociation. I mean, I, I think he, his grip on reality is, you know, incredibly thin a lot of the time. And when he's not out of touch with reality, he's just angry. What's he angry about? I've been caught. I could be caught. I could end up in an 8 by 10 foot cell. Now, I don't think he's thought about that. I don't think he has the capacity to imagine himself inside a cell. But we know from a lot of reporting that he is concerned. He was concerned about getting indicted. You dealt with developing a narrative, as they call it, a story about himself, which he then supersized. And you, you've talked about that. You've also given money to charity and talked about the evolution of that. You didn't want him to become president. The story he would tell in this trial, uh, would it be effective? Would it be different than the story his lawyers will try to tell? You know, I think he's so unmoored now. If you look at just, for example, his last speech, the one he just did in, I think, Texas was yeah. last week. Yeah. I mean, he is so unmoored from reality that I don't think he's a great witness. Um, hmm. Now, he would never be a great witness with a whole jury because many of them would go like, I don't <laughs> I don't believe you. But he in the past, I think, could have come off 
effectively with at least one or two. I'm not sure that he's, unless it's an absolute devotee, I'm not sure that he can hold himself together enough to be in any way persuasive. Hmm. The people around him, uh, so many, for so many reasons, are sycophantic, and yet we showed the reports that more people are cheering this. I mean, if, you, if you're being railroaded or you've been even halfway decent to people, they might, they might quibble with you as a boss. It doesn't mean they want you to be wrongly uh, prosecuted. Uh, so that, what did you make of the, the, the reported quiet cheering among people who, like yourself, at one time worked with him? I th oh, the quiet cheering, mm -hmm. that they're happy? they're happy? Well, nobody likes Donald Trump. I mean, literally nobody <laughs> likes Donald Trump. Ivanka has now basically said today with her statement, I'm no longer with the guy. I'll, mean, read, I'll read that. We have that. She says, quote, I love my father and I love my country, as if they're separate. <laughs> I'm they're opposite. Opposite. I'm paying for both. I appreciate the voices across the spectrum expressing support and concern. Yeah, I mean, it is such a carefully crafted statement. She must have had three, three people help her write that. But uh, the net of it is, I'm not with this guy anymore. I told you, I like, I've had it. If she's had it, might the Republicans take a page out of that? And the answer is no. I mean, that's the infection of Donald Trump, is that it's no longer just Trump. It's that he's actually moved an entire party, millions and millions of people, into absolute comfort with lying, with uh, creating a utterly fictional reality, with gaslighting. I mean, we have moved a whole country to, or a half of a country, to its worst instincts. He has. Mm -hmm. And that is a terrifying thought. And we live in a terrifying time right now. I mean, when you think of the range of things that threaten us, it's no wonder. I notice, for example, this is utterly anecdotal, but I notice so many people talking about all the physical ills they have right now. I think it's fundamentally psychosomatic. I think that, you know, stress is overwhelming to people. It's showing up in their bodies. It's showing up in depression. It's showing up in mental health. All of this is the consequence of his effectiveness as a, as a despot in bringing people to an utterly illogical place. Yeah, all of that makes sense. Then there's a counterpoint compared to the two campaigns and the insurrection. And this was the last thing I wanted to ask you about. Donald Trump posts, this is the worst thing ever. Come take your country back and protest. He gives a day. There's no major protest. No. Now, he's been indicted. I showed the papers. We're a day into that story, and Tuesday's an arraignment, and I'm not attempting uh, anything here in the news, and we also will report on and fairly respect peaceful protest. But what does it tell you that the public crowd that he expected and summoned as of yet has not materialized in the slightest, not even to the tune of 10% of the crowd he would want? Free at last. Free at last. I don't think he carries that same level of command anymore. He's turned a lot of people, but they're not going to do the same. There's an awful lot of them, including, you know, uh, those who showed up at the Capitol who have been able to observe that they might end up in jail if they do what he tells them to do. Hmm. And he did tell them again. And you're right. They haven't done it yet. I hope they won't.